anybody know somebody that all they do is complain, right? Complain, complain. <laughs> Cynthia goes. <laughs> Now, I'm going to use grumbling and complaining as the same interchangeable words throughout this. So, Old Testament, the, the, they said to Moses, it is because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness. What have you done to us bringing us out of Egypt? Is it, it, It's not this what we said to you in Egypt. Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. That's Exodus 14, 11, 12. Complaining, complaining. And the people grumbled against Moses saying, what shall we drink? Exodus 15, 24. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord because he has heard your grumbling against the Lord. For what are we? that you grumble against us. And Moses said in Exodus 16, 7, 8, when the Lord gives you in the evening meat to eat and in the morning bread to be full because the Lord has heard your grumbling, that you grumble against him. What are we? Your grumbling is not against us. It's against the Lord, God. Now, before moving on, let's review what's going on here. I've lost some of you. God has just delivered his people out of slavery for hundreds of years from Egypt. They just got out. And they're already and complaining. They're already complaining and griping. And God free me. Let me be free. So they're free. And so now they're complaining about being free. What a people. Moses is leading him through the wilderness according to God's plan, but the people are still complaining. Life in Egypt was not good. They were slaves to a ruthless dictator who demanded the impossible from them, and they got nothing in return. Kind of like a marriage. <laughs> Charlie told me to say that. <laughs> I tell you, you guys need to stay away from Charlie. <laughs> they longed for freedom. They longed for deliverance. They longed for a savior. And God delivered. But they were already forgotten how bad it was in Egypt. They were in transition on their way to the promised land, but it was much harder than they expected. There's too much discomfort. So they complain. So here's the problem. If God promises you that you're going to reach the promised land, why is it that all you do is complain about what God's doing to prepare you for the promised land? Why is it that we complain about negative things happening when our prayers are about prosperity? Why are we complaining and moaning and groaning and cursing God and asking God why and complaining to God when we're better off than we were a year ago? We're better off than we were five years ago. But we're still going to find a reason to complain, right? In chapter 14... They complain and wish they were already back in Egypt as slaves. I mean, seriously, life is so bad. Please take me back to where I was when I was a slave. In chapter 15, they complain forgetting about God's miraculous and faithful provisions. In chapter 16, they complain because their hearts are full of unbelief. Now, let me get this straight. Old Testament. Let me, let me, let me, let's say you're a slave. Pharaoh gets mad. You got to make more brick with less straw. Your portions are rationed. You're told what to do, when to do it, and how to do it. You're working from sun up to sundown. You're getting beat like a redheaded stepchild. No offense to redheads in here. And your life is miserable. So you pray to God to send you a deliverer. God hears your prayers. He sends you Moses. He frees you. And within a few hours, he can understand it. Why have you led us to the Red Sea? Now you've trapped us so we can't go anywhere. They already forgot about the plagues. They already forgot about the deaths of the firstborn. They've already forgot about 
how horrid it was with Pharaoh, and they have already forgotten how powerful God is. You know why? Because they're human, ungrateful people that all they want to do is complain. So, quick lessons about complaining. What can we learn so far about this? Complaining is a natural response to difficulty. It's human, but it's not a human Christian. There's a difference. Human reactions by sinful human beings is a different reaction from a Christian human being. We're still sinners. The Christian and the unbeliever are still going to sin. The Bible says so. But the complaint system should be a little different. Complaining is a symptom of a bigger issue. We complain when we forget how far we've come, when we forget what God has done, when we take our eyes off his character and doubt his plan in our lives. When we complain, we're actually grumbling and complaining to God himself in person, his soul, his spirit. You're telling God you don't care. It's all about me. I will complain even to God and expect God to continue to bless you. I hate to be the burden of bad news here, people, but that ain't going to happen. Loyalty is number one with God. Loyalty, love. When we complain, we are complaining into God's face. When we complain about people he's placed in our lives, we are complaining about him. When we complain about our circumstances, we're complaining about him. Consider this. When we complain about the weather, we're complaining against God because God created everything. God is gracious. God is merciful and forgives us for complaining. But when his people complain yet again and again and again and again and again, he miraculously provided for them even though they didn't deserve it. He let them have water. He let them have meat. He let them have bread. As much as they complained, there were some in there whose prayers were so good that God, being as merciful as he is, said, I'm going to feed you. I'm going to give you drink, and you're going to be all right. God being God, right? Look, I'm going to show you more. You don't deserve to see any more, but I'm going to show your butts a little bit more. And the people continued to complain. And they complained at hearing of the Lord about their misfortunes. And then when the Lord heard it, his anger was kindled. And the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed them outlying parts of the camp. Then the people cried out to Moses. And Moses prayed to the Lord, and the fire went down. So the name of the Lord was placed on the Taborah because of the fire of the Lord burnt amongst them. So they complained, God gets mad, he gets vengeful. He starts a fire, consumes part of them. They go to Moses. Moses prays to God, and God, in his mercy, kindles the fire and says, okay, here I am again. I've got you out of Egypt. I parted the Red Sea. I have fed you. Now you want this. I've given you this. Surely you'll never complain to me again. Now, the rabble that was among them had a strong craving. And the people of Israel also wept again and said, Oh, that we had meat to eat. Numbers 11, 1, 4. So the name of the place was, is that it? The fire of the Lord burned. Oh, if we had meat to eat. Here we see the complaining can have serious consequences. Complaining angers God. But again, God is gracious and merciful. So we also see that people can be slow learners. Slow learners. Immediately after the people experience a horrific consequence for their sinful attitudes, guess what? They did it again. In Numbers 12.1, Miriam and Aaron dislike Moses' choice of wife, and they get jealous of his role as God's mouthpiece to the people. So they complained about it. This again angered God. And he calls them out and rebukes them for the afflicts Miriam and leper and afflicts Miriam with leprosy. Aaron recognizes their sin and repents. Here's the thing: 
They couldn't recognize it. Coming out of Egypt to the Red Sea, to being hungry, to being thirsty, to having the fire consume them, to have the fire die down. They couldn't have reconciled to the fact that if you make God mad, as much as you think God loves you, let me give you a bit of advice. Don't make him mad. It's bad. So, Moses begs God for mercy. But God requires Miriam to wait the usual seven days of isolation before being restored to the people. It became obvious at that point to Miriam, to Aaron, and to everyone else again that complaining angers God. It is an abomination and a sin. Oh, yeah, by the way, that's biblical. What is the cause of complaining? In this story, we also saw that jealousy can, can cause a complaining heart. Wanting what somebody else has can cause a complaining heart. So complaining is a symptom of envy and discontentment within your own life. We also see that even when God is merciful, even when he forgives us, we still have to face the consequences of our actions of complaining constantly to God about what he's trying to do and prepare for us in our lives. The entire chapter of number 16, number 16 teaches us that these same lessons, but in a much dramatic way, in a different, more um, idolized or story. That, that and, and I encourage you to read your Bible. I encourage you to read Numbers. I encourage you to read Numbers 15 and 16 right now specifically. Now, the last Old Testament passage we'll look at <clears throat> sounds familiar, especially after what I just read. From the Mount Or. They set out by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient on the way. And the speak people spoke against God, and they spoke against Moses. In Numbers 21, 4, 6, it says, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food, there is no water. We have no loaf in the wilderness food, worthless food. When the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bent the people, so that many people of Israel died. Another root of complaining is this might be the key to everything. Human impatience. Be patient with God. Quit complaining. When we become impatient, we're more prone to complain. We must guard our hearts at all times. Job's complaining wife. The last Old Testament passage gives us a power and powerful insight. When his wife said to him, do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die and get rid of the pain and get through with this. But he said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women who would speak. Shall we receive good from God? Shall we not receive evil? And all this, Job did not sin with his lips. Job's 2, 9 through 10. He did not curse God. He did not complain. He just broke the storm out. And at the end of that storm, what happened with Job? He got everything a hundred times more or a thousand times more because he stayed true to the promise of God. <laughs> Job and his wife had just lost everything. Their possessions, their children, their reputation, Job's health, Job's faith in God's forgiveness frustrated Job's wife. He has nothing negative to say about God in all of his trials, but his wife wants, wants Job to curse God and die. Sounds like she was really good at complaining. But Job's response gives us an important nugget of truth. He tells her she's foolish and then asks, if we're happy to accept good things for God, shouldn't we also accept the bad? His point is that if we trust God as God, we like his plan and he gives us good gifts. Should we not also trust God when his plan doesn't make sense to us and it's difficult to handle? When we don't understand what he's doing to our lives or what we're going through, shouldn't we look back at the good that's been happening to us lately? And not complain knowing that that promised land that was promised to, to, to them all those years ago is promised to you today. 
All you have to do is sit back and don't complain to God. I mean, I, I think God gets enough complaining from people. Let's not be one of the ones that are doing it. <clears throat> the Old Testament also talks about complaining. Jesus answered him, do not grumble against yourselves or among yourselves. John 6, 43. Now, this is straightforward. Jesus commands us not to grumble or complain. Therefore, when we complain, we are disobeying God. That means complaining is a sin. We must not put God to the test. And some of them did and were destroyed by serpents, nor grumble, and some of them did, and they were destroyed by the destroyer. That's in 1 Corinthians 10, 9, 10, 10. Again, we see that complaining can have dire consequences. Complaining leads to destruction. It gives the enemy of our souls a foothold in our lives. Peter 4, 9 says, show hospitality to one another without grumbling or complaining. Peter tells us to be hospitable without complaining. Why would he say that? Why didn't he just say, show hospitality to one another and just leave it at that? Why did he ask, add grumbling or complaining? Could it be that showing hospitality requires sacrifice and that we humans struggle with sacrifice of our own time, comfort, and our conveniences? See, here's the deal. Complaining is a human response to difficulty. Complaining angers God. It's a sin. Complaining about anything is complaining against God. Complaining is a symptom of a bigger issue, like unbelief, envy, selfishness, discontent, or impatient, impatience. Complaining can and will have serious consequences on your life. So the thing that I want to emphasize here is complaining is a killer. It's just a straight killer. Complaining will, will short circuit the life that God has for you. It indirectly communicates to God that I don't like what you're doing in my life. And if I were you, I'd change it or I'm going to quit following you. It's people telling God that I know what's best for you better than you know what's best for me. We're trying to play God within our own selves. When we're complaining against God, we're telling God, the creator of all, we're telling him that your plans for your life are much better than what he has for your life. We're telling God that what we want is more important than what you want for us. We're telling God that this amount of time of our lives isn't worth the sacrifice that you want us to go through to reach the wilderness of the land of prosperity of milk and honey that you promised. We're telling God that even though he created this in his own image, he made a mistake because we're just as good as he is because we know what's best for us. He doesn't. See, we're telling God that he doesn't understand us. We're telling God, I read a, book, a, a magazine article that said people are trying to tell God that he's lost touch with reality. He's not kept up with the times. That he doesn't understand what's going on in the world today. Let me tell you something. 2,000 years ago when he died on the cross, God knew what was going on 2,000 years ago. He didn't have to tell him what was going on. He knew it. He knew what the heart would be. He knew what the soul would be. He knew how messed up this world would be. He knew everything from the cross. But he still died. Because there's still hope. There's still people preaching the gospel. There's still people living as Christians in this world. There's still people helping one, one another. And there's still people that no matter what goes on in their life, they will do whatever it takes to please God and not complain. Because I'll tell you something, what I do know about God. What God starts, he finishes. And I also know where there's a finish, there's an end. And I also know that if we stay faithful with God without complaining, without malice and, and discernment in our hearts, I know that that finish line will produce the greatest prosperity you've ever had in your life. And not just for you, for the people around you, for your family, for your kids, for your grandkids, for everyone. We can and you can. If you stop complaining to God, if you let him play the card deck for you, if you just pick up the cards, that deck is going to be stacked in your favor every single hand. 
Everything that you could ever think you wanted in life will become a reality. But it's not free. Salvation is free. That came at our, it had already been stamped and paid in full when Jesus took his last breath. That was our redemption. That was our salvation. That was Jesus telling us that you matter. And every time you complain to God, you're telling God that he does not matter, that you know what's best for you. Every time that you say an ill word for God, or every time that you put yourself over what God wants, you're telling God that your thought and belief process is better than what his thought and belief process is. That doesn't work. It never has, as I just showed you. See, I'm just not up here spouting. I gave you things that have happened, Old Testament and New Testament. We're in the last testament. This is it. Uh uh, no more. Over. Look at the sign of the times. There is going to be a end. Where do you want to be? Do you want to be one of those people at the gate? Lord, please. Yeah, I know I made a mistake. God's going to look at you and say, yeah, you did. Bye. You don't get to negotiate at that point. 19, I'm not going to have the year right. Probably somewhere between 43 and 45. Mordecai Ham did a, a tent revival in Charlotte, North Carolina. And someone from the audience stood up and said, how dare you bring that into our city? How dare you bring this into our city? Why do you come here and call us filthy rags? Mordecai Ham got on him, wasn't even a mic, just screaming, and said, I'm going to tell you why God brought me to Charlotte, North Carolina. He did bring me here because you're all filthy rags. He brought me here because the Bible says we're sinners, every single one of us. But he brought me here to save somebody. He brought me here to change the life of somebody. He brought me here because he wants me here. He wants me to change somebody's life today. I want to change somebody's life in this church today. I want somebody to go from complainer to rejoicer, from not wanting to, to abundantly wanting to. That person that Mordecai Ham saved that night was a guy by the name of Billy Graham. You ever heard of him? Yeah. Billy Graham did not want to go to that crusade. He went because his sister was in the choir. He went to support his family member. But he left a new creation in Christ. Led more people to the cross than anybody other than Jesus to this point. I want people to look deep down in their hearts today. I want you to look deep down in your soul today. And I don't want any of this crap about all the pastor said, all the pastor said. I want purity in your heart today. I want people to look deep in their hearts, deep in their soul, deep in their mind, and don't let their mind outweigh what their heart's trying to tell them. I'm looking for somebody in here to finally just stand up and say, I get it. I get it. There's a start, there's a finish. I get it. God, I won't complain anymore. I'm going to trust that this finish is going to be the greatest thing that I could ever think of or hope from in my life. I'm going to pray, God, that whatever you started is going to be what you promised, and that's a glorious finish. I am going to, from this point forward, not complain. I'm just going to let the card roll. I'm going to trust that you've got that ace in the hole in my life. But I'm also not going to worry about me. I've always worried about me and what I wanted in this thing. I've always worried about me. God, I'm going to worry about you. I'm going to worry about what is on the other side of that rainbow. And kids, cover your ears. It's not a leprechaun. <laughs> it's not the proverbial pot of gold. It's bigger than that. It's the biggest gold mine you could ever, ever think of. It's pearly gates. It's a golden city. It's mansions that were promised us. If you can stop complaining long enough, and if you can give God abundantly more than he asked, God is going to give you abundantly more than you think. Because that is biblical. This isn't me up here just spewing stuff just to do it. This is all Old Testament, New Testament, King James, New King James, NIV, EAS, 
whatever else you want to put in there. This is biblical. This is what God said, man heard, and wrote down. I don't know how more plain it can get than that. See, God didn't use the old school system where I'm going to tell Jeff something, he's going to tell Teresa something, he's going to tell her something. Mitch, nobody's going to tell you anything. We're going to skip Mitch and go straight to Brian. And we're going to tell them something. Maybe. And by the time it gets to Charlie, what I've told them is only about 10% the truth. The other 90% is what they thought. This is directly from our God to one man to paper. From our Jesus to paper. From our Jesus to an apostle to paper. This is what this is. There isn't any phone line where it's got to go through 10 people and you might hear the truth. This is straight from God. Stop complaining. Stop grumbling. Stop not doing what I want you to do and do it more abundantly because I'm telling you guys this. Job's punishment started and it ended with greater prosperity than he's ever thought of. Look at everyone. Now we can't prove what happened to Jeremiah, but there is theological evidence that Jeremiah left, never married, never had children, but did start, did start a new country, a new colony of, of believers in God. Isaiah. We know that Isaiah stayed true to God. We know everything that's happened in the Bible was for the glory of God. Guys, we're still living in that time. Nobody has ever shut the book on that Bible and said, oh, you know what happened? And that's all there is. Bye-bye. We're still living by those laws, by those rules. But the, the fundamental fact is this. We are still governed by the same God. We still have the same God that spoke to Abram, that spoke to Sarah, that spoke to Isaac, that spoke to, to Isaiah, that spoke to Jeremiah, that spoke to all Samuel, that spoke to all the other prophets. That is still the same God today telling you how to run your life. But you're trying to tell God, I know better. I know what's best for me. Everybody knows one of those people. Don't tell me what to do. I know what's good for me. You may be able to tell that to your boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, man, uncle, whatever. You can't tell that to God because you don't. God knows what's better for you. You don't. Now, it may make you sad. Sorry about that. May make you uncomfortable. Sorry about that too. But when it's all said and done, the lives that you will change, the life that you will leave, and the glory that will be bestowed on you is greater than any problem that you could ever have during a lifetime. Because we are promised that. Look at the apostles, look at the prophets, and look at the people that God used in the past. How they were punished, and then how they were rewarded. The reward was far greater than any punishment. I'm telling you today, I'm telling you today that if you'll put self aside, stop grumbling and complaining to God, that God has something in store for you that you couldn't write on paper and think it was a fictional book. You couldn't write it down and go, oh, wow. I, re I remember reading a, a book. I don't, it, it's a guy that was in the Olympics. I, I can't remember his name. <laughs> and it wasn't, it wasn't a book. It was a section out of a, a magazine. I didn't read the whole magazine, just his portion. He grew up being made fun of in his life. His father was a, was a traveling pastor. His mother was a homemaker. They barely made ends meet. He ran. That's what he did. He ran. He just wanted to be away from everybody, so he ran. And he kept running. And he kept being alone. And then he found God. And he talked to his father about God. And he was telling him that it doesn't matter what people think of you. We know what God thinks of you. And everybody, you know, this was the kid that was picked last in everything in school. Oh, we don't want him on our team. He's the poor kid. Or they're not the popular family and blah, blah, blah. Well, he went on to win two gold medals for the United States. He attributes that to God touching him and allowing that to happen. That's a true story. There's a lot of stories about people that have not. There's stories about people that didn't have an athletic bone in their body coming out of it and being world champions and, and Olympians. You know how that happened? They stopped complaining and they started believing. 
God touches you. And in just a, a short amount of time, you go from, you know, you go from no ability, clumsy OU, to a champion in whatever field you pick. Not just a champion, a world champion. Because, see, God doesn't breed losers. God breeds winners. We have to believe in God. We have to believe in, in the capability that he has for our life. But you've got to put yourself... You've got to get rid of your self-centeredness. You've got to get rid of the, the me attitude. We've got to get back to God. We've got to get back to the Bible. And, and I'll tell you what God needs. I'll tell you what my opinion is of what God needs. God needs more people to stand up and say, I had nothing. And then God came into my life, and now look what I got. We need more people to stand up and go, man, I didn't have an athletic bone in my body. I, I, I don't know. I know God touched me, and here I am, all praise and glory to God. You may like or dislike Tim Tebow, but Tim Tebow will point blank tell you he was a kid with very little talent that ended up being a two-time Heisman winner, playing in the NFL, played Major League Baseball, and now travels the world talking about how great God is. People like those stories are everywhere. You just don't want to listen to them. You don't want to hear the story of Job because people's like, how could God do that to somebody? Well, how could, how could all these people do that to God? Quit looking about how God can and start looking about what God can. Because God can and he will change your life. Do what he says more abundantly than he wants. He will touch you and your family and, you know, who knows? Maybe you'll be an Olympic champion. Senior Olympic champion. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, is there a category for set up your butt with your feet on the table? For the I'd win gold. I'd win gold. But there could be. And then I'd be a world champion. Don't set yourself short. But don't set God short either. If God wants you to do something, do it more abundantly than you want. Quit complaining to God. Just stop it. Quit grumbling amongst your, yourselves going, why this, why that? Like the Egyptians did. They weren't worried about what happened to them three months ago, six months ago, a year ago, two years ago. They weren't looking back at the poverty that they had into the prosperity that they had today. They were only looking at, well, I'm hungry. Well, God, you know, where's our food? Well, I'm thirsty. God, where's our, our meat? Where's our drink? Where's our water? God, I don't, I don't want him to leave us anymore. Moses has been gone too long. God forsake us. Moses is up there dead somewhere. I know what we can do. We can gather up all the gold. This is a really good idea. We can make a golden calf. And then we can pray to it because it's going to do more than what this God guy did because he killed Moses. How'd that work out? And that's something about the, the, the hole opening up and those people going down in it. That was just an early attempt to send them to hell before their time. Amen? Amen. Every time somebody's went against God, there has been death and destruction. Every time. Don't be the example this time. Listen to God. Make yourself. Seriously. Whatever you've done, whoever you were, from this point forward, make you make you the example of the goodness that God can do in somebody's life. Make you the example of your children or world athletes, world class athletes. That you're the greatest, whatever you choose to be. Charlie, you don't cook, do you? You can leave here as a best ramen noodle microwave cook guy in the world. Charlie, that's possible. Right? Everybody can leave this church today. And, and here's the thing, with all, all seriousness, you can start doing more for God today. Because understand, there's a start and there's a finish. And the finish is closer than you think in your life because we're only given so many years. We don't know what God does. Why don't you choose today to do more abundantly than what God wants? Why don't you choose today to stop complaining about everything going on in your life? Why don't you choose today to keep your business to you and keep everybody else's business to them, not to you? Why don't you decide today?
to be the best Christian and the best follower of God that you can be. If we choose that today, this generation gets fixed and the next generation prospers. It really is that simple. But here's, here's the stone cold fact. Here's the stone cold fact. It won't happen. Because as sure as I'm talking here and out there to those two TV stations, people are going to listen to this sermon and they're going to go back and, and read scripture and they're going to go, well, you know, I, he just really still doesn't understand me. God understands you. And he also knew what you were going to say. We need exceptions to the rules today. We need people to stand up and be an exception to the rule today. To give it to God and leave it there. Quit complaining. God, if you're faithful to God and you don't make him angry, God is going to give you more abundantly than what you ever thought of. He's done it in the past over and over and over in that book called The Good Book for a Reason. It's good. The Blueprint of Life, the Holy Bible. He's done it over and over and over so that we could have those examples today. So that we can look back and instead of going, well, you've never done it before, we can go, ah, now wait a minute. Now wait a minute. He's done it a lot. And it's just not me saying that. It's been proven over and over and over. So as soon as I'm done, as soon as Austin and the outlaws are done, step back and contemplate this whole service. The music, the message, and everything. Contemplate your life. Everything that's going on in your life. Think about it. Think about how you can improve your life by just obeying God. And then watch your life improve. Not tomorrow. Instantly. Because that's how God works. He knows your faith. He knows your heart. And if God was here right now, he would say, God, God. God. See you guys next week.